I'm Pat Wall. I'm the fourth dean of the School of Public Health and Community Medicine. As such, I'm just trying to uh, keep balance on top of the shoulders of giants who were the former deans of public health, uh, Tom Grayston, Bob Day, and Gil Oman. I'm going to give you a little bit about my background because a lot of it uh, is tied with the School of Public Health's history itself. Uh, I graduated with a bachelor's in math. I programmed for a couple of years with Lockheed Missiles and Systems in California. At the same time, I was a graduate student at Stanford University. I took a little time out one winter to uh, go ski racing and working at Alta, Utah as a ski bum. Uh, it was a longer detour than I had planned because I met and married my daughter's father. We moved to Minneapolis where I worked as a programmer at Control Data Corporation. After my daughter Gretchen was born, we moved to Seattle and I took a job at the University of Washington Computer Center here. At some point when I was working at the Computer Center, Professor Dick Cronwell came over and asked me to do some programming for him. Apparently the program worked because he then offered me an opportunity to uh, be on the biometry training grant to get a PhD in biostatistics. Now I saw it as a great opportunity to spend more time with my daughter at home and to pay for graduate school, but I really had no idea what biostatistics was. Uh, all Dick could really tell me that if I got a PhD in biostatistics, I could tell programmers what to do instead of vice versa. So I started the program, took courses from Ed Perrin, who was chair of the Department of Biostatistics, uh, also from Dick, who was head of our biomathematics group degree program, uh, from Doug Chapman, who was at that time head of fisheries quantitative sciences division, and also from Z.W. Birnbaum, Galen Shorak, and Ron Pike. Uh, at that time, they were in the math department, and they later moved when it was formed to a new department of statistics on campus. I also took a sampling course from Donovan Thompson, who had just arrived from Pittsburgh. Fellow students at that time, as best I can remember, were Dick Gilbert. Uh, he later married Ethel Schaefer, who was a faculty member in biostatistics. They subsequently had a son, Peter, who was then a graduate student in our Department of Biostatistics and now is on the faculty at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. Another person who was a fellow student was Sally Shields Anderson, also Bob Francis, Vern Crandall, Virginia Gonzalez, Gary Anderson, and Dave Hosmer. Sally and Dave are really the only ones that I still keep in contact with. Uh, Dick Cronwell was my dissertation advisor, and I had the pleasure of working with Abe Bergman on my biostat biology project, and we worked on the sudden infant death syndrome. I think the graduate days around here were described very well in Dick Cronwell's distinguished faculty lecture. It was mostly about carrying large decks of IBM cards around with us to run on the program uh, and get our results. I did my typing of my dissertation primarily at home so I could keep an eye on my daughter. Uh, and my little ruse was to keep my dissertation in the freezer because I was really afraid that if I left and the house burned down or something, I would lose my dissertation. The only problem was at that time we were using these stick-on math symbols because typewriters didn't have those types of symbols. And every time I put my dissertation in the, sim in the freezer, the symbols would fall off, so that was a bit of a problem. I did take a little longer to finish uh, graduate school because I was going to school part-time with my daughter. Uh, Ed Perrin occasionally threatened to take me off of the training grant. He thought I was taking too long. I think he really thought that I was skiing, which was probably not unreasonable because I was helping to run a ski school at that time. Although he threatened this, he never did it. I think he really didn't have anyone else to put on it instead. It was during that time that the School of Public Health was formed. Um, I had no idea what was happening with the exception that Dick Cronwell thought it was a terrible idea. He was afraid there were going to be many burdensome requirements. And I think Dick was probably right, but uh, certainly Tom Grayston did the right thing 
by starting the school, it was certainly better than remaining in the Department of Pre Preventive Medicine in the School of Medicine. The best things that I can remember about the Department of Biostatistics was usually lunch. It was lunch with uh, Bob Day, with uh, uh, an offer from him uh, to me as a graduate school student to have lunch with him and his wife. I really don't know if he did it with all students, but uh, we always had a good time talking about skiing. It was really only later that I understood what being a dean meant, and I was really impressed that he took the time to have lunch with me. During the time I was a graduate student, I was also a teaching assistant for Dick's course. Uh, he was teaching a course to the uh, nurses in the nursing school. And after graduation, I was actually offered a faculty position. Uh, one of the reasons was to take over uh, Dick's class. I, at that time, really thought that teaching was the last thing I wanted to do, but after doing it, I found I really liked teaching. I subsequently taught Blair Bennett's course in the School of Dentistry to dentists when Blair went to Hawaii. I think both courses went well primarily because I was a woman. Uh, the nurses felt they could do statistics if another woman could, and the dentists were convinced they could do statistics, surely, if, if a woman could do them. So it worked out fairly well. Uh, Ed tried very hard to find support uh, for me on a research project in the School of Nursing. Uh, that particular one didn't work out. Uh, research projects for newly recruited faculty is kind of the way the school has always grown, and I think probably will continue to grow. My first research project was as a biostatistician in the Northwest Lipid Research Clinic. Joanne Hoover, who was a faculty member in epidemiology, was the epidemiologist for them, and we designed and implemented a study of lipid levels in the Pacific Northwest Bell Company, as it was called then. About the time that I began as a faculty member in biostatistics, although it wasn't related, uh, Ed Perrin, I think, uh, left for Washington, D.C. to head up the Center for uh, National Health Statistics, and Donovan Thompson became the chair. Uh, about that time also, the department uh, moved to the sixth floor, which was a new floor that had just been built. Uh, we moved from the east side of the third floor in the F wing. As I recall, when I was a graduate student, the computer center was on the northeast corner of the third floor. Uh, our open student facilities were in the middle, and then the faculty were on the southeast corner of the third floor, and uh, the chair and administrative staff was where our school's uh, development office uh, is now on the south side. One of the best things about, uh, always again, about lunch uh, was lunch with Donovan and the Department of Biostatistics. He always assembled us at lunchtime. We used to have lunch in the CDMRC building, and then when that closed, we went to the South Campus uh, Center. At Donovan's table, there was always room for one more. We would end up with 10 or 12 at a table that was probably meant for four. Uh, Don Peterson from the Department of Epidemiology, he was chair at that time, joined us usually, as did Ed Boatman from Environmental Health, and there were often miscellaneous faculty from different departments around. One of the best things about it was Donovan really liked to tell personal stories about when he was a personal aide for a military commander. I don't remember what branch of service, but he had some good tales to tell. I was very happy when Donovan started skiing. Uh, because that stopped some of the boys' talk around the table, which heretofore had consisted mainly of basketball, ba baseball, and football. Uh, when Norm Breslow and Ross Prentice uh, joined the department, they were also very helpful in uh, getting the conversation more about skiing and other things. Of course, in the summer, Donovan talked about golf because that was his big interest then. He even talked Dick into starting golf with him, which Dick subsequently stopped and went to, back to baseballs because the department had a baseball team that I believe, was, I recall, was called the Residuals. The one thing, good thing is that Paula Deere has really made great efforts to keep up this biostat lunch tradition in the department even now. 
One of the things that was very clear was that under Donovan, the department grew significantly both in size and in its stature. I think it's a real tribute to Donovan that the department really spanned a great many future leaders in academic and administration. It was Ken Anderson's uh, history narrative uh, that described, I think, quite well all of the many biostat faculty leaders that uh, came out of uh, Donovan's department. Uh, and I think a lot of this was due to Donovan's uh, leadership style. He, was, he presented a very good model of openness, honesty, transparency, and Donovan just had a lot of good old common sense. I recall many faculty meetings and discussions of issues. He always would carefully listen to all faculty points of view, and then he would decide what he was going to do. He'd tell us what he was going to do. He'd tell us why he was going to do it. And then he'd suggest that anyone who disagreed could file a minority report. I don't recall that any ever did, but he gave that opportunity. I think his collegiality, both within the department, but also elsewhere across the school, has really influenced the school culture to this day. He also developed for us, I think, a wonderful relationship with the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, because when Donovan stepped down as department chair, he moved to leadership position at the Fred Hutchinson in the Public Health Sciences Division. This was all uh, centralized uh, or cemented the relationship when Bob Day uh, took over from being dean here to the head of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and Ross Prentice, faculty member in biostatistics, uh, became director of the Public Health Sciences Division at the Fred Hutchinson. One day when I was having lunch at the South Campus Center, Gil Oman, who was dean at that came up to me and said, there's something good I think you should do for the school. I immediately thought he was going to suggest I should probably quit. Uh, instead, he suggested that I might consider becoming the next associate dean. Uh, Tim DeRuin, who was presently associate dean, was a colleague of mine in biostatistics and was moving to the School of Dentistry where he became chair of a new department of dental public health sciences. I actually believe that Paula Deere and uh, Polly Feigl had already uh, refused the job. But I was interested in academic administration, so I agreed with Gil that I would try it for a year or so. Uh, and Gil said, eh, that would be no problem. He was probably going to be moving on anyway in that amount of time, and he wasn't bothered that I might not stay. As it turns out, clearly both of us were wrong and we both stayed much longer than we, either of us, I think, expected at that time. Being an associate dean under Gill was a really great opportunity. It was really the first time I saw the school as a whole. I'd really been very much involved in biostatistics, but not a great deal with the rest of the school. Gill was a very strong leader. He had strong ideas, but the wonderful thing about Gill was that he was willing to change his mind if you could give him a good argument. So I think I really learned most of what I know about deaning uh, under Gill, uh, just observing him. He was very good and gave me independence to manage the quote unquote other side of the office, which was faculty affairs. And over there I had Ken Anderson and Helen McQueen who really taught me all I needed know about the other side. I frankly think they could have probably run it all by themselves, but they were kind enough to let me think that I was running, running the office. In 1995, I was acting chair of the Department of Pathobiology uh, while they were doing a chair search down there, and at that time, Paula Deere from Biostatistics came down and was the acting associate dean. It was during Gill's tenure that I think the school really grew exponentially in both faculty size and clearly in research. The challenge was the faculty were growing, but the state resources were not. So uh, Gill established a new policy in which he would award tenure at 50% instead of at 100%. So when someone with 100% tenure retired, he would split that position into two 50% positions. It was at that time, thanks to Norm Breslow, who was then chair of biostatistics, that I received my 50% tenure, and also Paula Deere, between the help of Norm and Ed Perrin, who was at that time chair of health services, she also got her 50% tenure. 
This 50 percent tenure policy is something that I continued when I became dean, and I think now only one or two faculty actually have 100 percent tenure. Uh, we were able to reduce the tenure level when I was dean by offering salary increases to faculty that was based totally on their grant funding. We called it preemptive uh, retention. It's uh, subsequently been adopted by School of Medicine and several schools here on campus. It's now called the AB salary policy where A is a faculty member's base and B is their grant um, uh, uh, funding. Ken Anderson, I think, was the real creative genius behind that, uh, developing it, and then he and I both worked with Vice Provost Steve Olswang to, to implement it. And at that time, and then we did it one time later, it really allowed us to have significant increases in salary for uh, many, of, many of the faculty who qualified. In 1997, Gill became Vice President of Health Affairs at the University of Michigan, and I was appointed the Acting Dean of the School. This university did a national search. It was chaired by Paul Robertson, who was the Dean of Dentistry. Uh, they had two excellent uh, outside candidates, Mike McGinnis and Linda Rosenstock. Paul pressured me to become the third candidate. I think he wanted to have an inside candidate. And I reluctantly agreed because I thought the two outside candidates were so good that I was safe. Mike, in fact, was uh, selected, but at the last minute he went to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, took a position there, and uh, President McCormick at that time offered the deanship to me. Linda Rosenstock is now dean of UCLA, and it's been great uh, for the two of us to work together. So in 1999, I became dean. I started with a terrific group of chairs, three of which were appointed by Gill. Tom Fleming was Chair of Biostatistics, Bill Dowling, Chair of Health Services, and Ken Stewart, Chair of Pathobiology. Dave Kelman was the Acting Chair of Environmental Health at that time, and he accepted the position as Chair. Emily White was the Acting Chair of Epi when I started. She wanted to step down after a year, so Jim Gale became the Acting Chair of Epi until we recruited Scott Davis to be the Chair of Epidemiology. He was at that time the Associate Director of Public Health Sciences at Fred Hutchinson and Ross Prentice was most gracious to sharing with us. In adding to the leadership team, I appointed Dave Eaton, who is Professor of Environmental Health as the Associate Dean of Research. This was a new position in our school, but I felt needed due to our high research activity. Fred Connell, Professor of Health Services, agreed to take the position as Associate Dean of Health academic affairs, mainly faculty affairs. And then I went to Puerto Rico where I recruited Mark Oberly. Mark Oberly had previously been here as a CDC liaison, had to return to CDC to finish up his career there. He retired from CDC and then went to Puerto Rico to write a book about the birds of Puerto Rico. So I was able to convince him to come back to Seattle. Fortunately, they'd kept a home here and he became Associate Dean for Public Health Practice. This was the first such position in the country, and now most schools of public health have either an Associate or an Assistant Dean of Public Health Practice. What I was really lucky was to find Holly Weiss, who is my assistant. In fact, she really knew more about the school and the Dean's office uh, than I did uh, when I started, because uh, as described in Bill Richardson's narrative, uh, Holly had worked for Bill when he was in the dean's office here as associate dean under Bob Day. She moved with him when he went to be the University of Washington's graduate school dean, followed him several moves, ended up at uh, Johns Hopkins when he was president there. But then when he went to head up uh, the Kellogg Foundation, fortunately, Holly came back to Seattle and uh, we were the lucky beneficiaries of that. Also, fortunately, Ken Anderson continued in his role at that time as finance director. And Ken's knowledge of the UW, his contacts with everybody throughout the university really helped our school and particularly helped me to navigate the University of Washington administration. The one thing I think particularly that Holly and Ken did was to establish a culture 
in the dean's office of being really a service organization, particularly to the school, but also to the rest of the university. Ken retired a couple of years ago, uh, which saddened me greatly, but uh, he really worked hard and found me a terrific replacement in Laurie Robertson. We had loaned Laurie from the time he worked with Ross Prentiss at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, and so we knew him well, he knew the school well, and he has a, been a very good financial director as a replacement uh, for Ken ever since. One of the things I did starting from scratch was to establish a school development office. Uh, we had not had a, a development officer of our, of our very own before that, and it was part of the request for my dean's dowry that uh, we were able to get one. The first goal for our development office was to make contact with our alumni. We suddenly realized after 30, 40 years, we had alumni out there and we needed to be talking to them. So we made an effort to really get in touch with all of them and get them up to speed on the school. And of course, at that time, the University of Washington was starting a new development campaign for $2 billion. And so we were heavily engaged in that. I'm pleased to say that campaign has essentially wound down and our school raised over $90 million, which was our target or goal at that time. I will confess that much of that is due to the faculty themselves getting grants from foundations which do count in your campaign. Uh, where we've done particularly good, I think, in development is in the faculty staff retiree matching program for student support. We have the highest participation rate in all of the university in our school, and I think it really shows just how much our faculty and staff and everyone cares about our students. We started a new uh, school publication, updates to give everybody information about the latest news in the school. And as every new dean usually does, we did a strategic plan. It was a pretty extensive one. We made an effort to get input from all of our faculty, staff, students, our alumni, and even the public health community. And through that, we were able to identify some key school goals and some very cross-cutting initiatives. The challenge, of course, is always in implementation of a strategic plan, but we use seed money uh, that I got uh, when, as part of my uh, dowry, some temporary money, and we used it as seed money for initiatives that uh, came to us from interested faculty. Uh, who proposals along the lines of what were some of our school-wide wide goals. Uh, our, one of our first initiatives was staff training, and that was so successful that we continue an annual allotment uh, to this day for staff uh, training. Other initiatives included activities in social epidemiology, social and behavioral science, a new nutritional sciences curriculum, and then uh, two strategic plans, one in health policy and one in global health or international health. Other new programs that have sort of come out of the SEED initiatives but were broader initiatives in school was a new PhD in health services, a PhD in public health genetics, community-oriented public health practice pathway in the MPH program, a Peace Corps master's, and more recently 12 new graduate certificate programs. One of the things that I was aware of when I became dean was that I had very little knowledge of public health practice in the real world. My career had been as a biostatistician in research and teaching totally within the walls the ivory of the ivory tower. So I decided I really needed to learn public health practice at the community level, and I thought I would visit maybe a few local health departments to just see what went on. Very wisely, Mark Oberly said, uh-uh, a few is not going to do, that you're not going to learn anything, every one of them is different, and so we pledged and actually did visit all 34 local health departments in the state. We also met with the Secretary of the Department of Health and the heads of some of the other health agencies. I also attended um, health director meetings in both Alaska, Montana, and then a regional meeting in Utah. So I think we learned that uh, from that visit, I certainly saw what public health looked like at the ground level, but we really learned too about what public health professionals thought about our school. 
and they were certainly aware of our school, but there was always a but. And whereas they really recognized, uh, thought we had great expertise here, they greatly respected our research, they thought our academic programs were very valuable, but they really didn't see that they directly benefited the public health the professionals themselves or the community. So after that, Mark Oberling and Jack Thompson, who is the director of our Northwest Public Health Practice Center, um, got two grants. One was a HRSA grant uh, to do public health training, and another was a CDC preparedness grant, and these were to cover the whole region, the really the Northwest W Whammy region, because after all, our school is really the only school of public health west of Minnesota and north of Berkeley. So this was now uh, the wider community that, um, with these grants, we were allowed to serve the public health practice community better than we certainly had been able to before. Out of also the visits to the local health departments and hearing what they needed in public health professionals hired or graduates from our program, we started a new pathway called the Community-Oriented Public Health Practice Pathway in our Master of Public Health program. Fred Connell developed this and it was a pretty unique program uh, based, used the pedagogy of problem-based learning um, based on real public health problems program continues to this day, is extremely popular uh, because of its didactic uh, model. We can't take a lot of students, only about 16, and I was just told today we have 85 that have applied this year. So it is a very popular program and a need that we really haven't been able to meet, but a good program nonetheless. Uh, also coupled with that, at that time we were able to get a one-year grant from the CDC to establish uh, the Public Health Seattle King County as an academic health department. And what this means, it's the same concept that uh, teaching hospitals have for schools of medicine as a place to train doctors. We then use the Public Health Seattle King County uh, health department as a place to train and give our students opportunities for practicums. It really, uh, although the grant went away, that same strong linkage that we built uh, there at that time really continues to this day between the school and Public Health Seattle King County. So these linkages between the school, public health practice community was really an important school goal for us and I think something that really we enhanced uh, at that time. One of the things we recognized, though, that if we were really going to do this seriously, we had to recognize and reward faculty scholarship for practice activities. So I requested the faculty council to review our school promotion guidelines, and they did this very thoroughly, a year-long process. It was iterative, went back and forth, and really produced an excellent faculty affairs handbook that, uh, within it, also defined academic public health practice activities and had explicit criteria for promotion for doing academic public health practice. And since that time, we've had several people uh, promoted uh, for doing that. Uh, so this was one of the first, we were one of the first schools of public health that had such uh, criteria and I think we were seen as a leader in demonstrating excellence in the area of academic public health practice. That coupled with having one of the first associate deans of public health practice, I think, has gained us a great deal of credibility, both locally and nationally, in the public health uh, professional community. One of the most exciting developments since I've been dean has been our new Department of Global Health. It's a joint department with the School of Medicine, and it all started with some seed money that uh, our executive committee gave to Steve Floyd to do a strategic plan on how to enhance the international health program, which was a pathway within the Master of Public Health. Uh, Steve asked King Holmes to co-chair the committee and interested faculty from both our school and the School of Medicine uh, joined the committee. Uh, they deliberated for quite a while and one day Steve and King asked to meet with me to present me with the first draft of their strategic plan and in it they had included a recommendation that there be in the School of Public Health a new Department of Global Health. Well, I said just no way. 
There's no possibility of that. We have no resources to start a new department in the school. I don't have enough resources to, for my existing departments now. So we negotiated and they agreed to change the language in the recommendation to be a recommendation for a global health center. So it was not too long after that that um, I was meeting with Bill Gates Sr., who was the chair of the UW's campaign committee, and he was going around talking individually to all the deans about what was on their agenda as far as school goals for the campaign. And I mentioned that one of our school goals was a center for global health. And it wasn't too long after that that I received an email from Bill. It was sent to both me and to Paul Ramsey, uh, who was the Dean of Medicine, that said that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was going to give us $10 million to develop a center of global health. They had one condition, and that was that public health and medicine were to work jointly together on this, being equal partners in this. So in a way, Paul, this was a challenge. It was wonderful, but it was a challenge to Paul and me because each of us has policies in our school that say centers and institutes cannot be in a dean's office. They must be in the departments in which the PI or the director of that center resides. And we both knew that if we put it in a department in either of our schools, that it wouldn't be truly joint and would be lost uh, this concept of equal partners in this. So Paul very wisely suggested that we look at the model of the Department of Bioengineering. It is a joint department between the School of Medicine and the College of Engineering. So I went up and talked to uh, Denise Denton, who was the Dean of Engineering at that time, about how well that worked for her, and, and she agreed that it did work quite well. So Paul and I then went to Bill Gates Sr. and asked if we could instead of using the money for a global health center, have it to develop a joint department of global health. And he fortunately agreed. So the irony is that Stephen King really made the right recommendation after all, and, and King, in fact, is the founding chair of this new department. Uh, it's really been a great opportunity for both Paul and me, I think, to work jointly. Uh, to develop this department. It's a real opportunity to bring the cultures of medicine and public health closer together. They're quite different, but uh, this department is bringing them together. And I think each of our schools has profited a great deal by the experience and seeing the best practices and how the other school does things. So it's been a great experience, and it continues to this day. Probably the most regrettable experience for me as a dean has been the demise of the Department of Pathobiology. Uh, it was a founding department of the school. I had served as acting chair of the department, and I had a very personal interest in the department and the faculty and its graduate program. Uh, as from the beginning, uh, resources in our school have always been scarce for all our departments, but the resources for the Department of Pathobiology has always been worse than any of the others. They had less than half of the state support that other departments did. And when Gill was dean, uh, there was serious consideration at that time of eliminating the department. He was able to get some money from the UW at that time uh, to keep the department going, but eventually the lack of state resources a couple of years ago really caught up with us. Uh, the UW was unable to provide additional resources, and I did not feel I could take any resources from any of the other departments who were under-resourced anyway to provide for pathobiology, which was not one of the required departments or disciplines to be an accredited school of public health. So we were forced to close the department uh, that will close this year in June of 2008. Uh, the good part about it was that the excellent uh, pathobiology graduate program due to its basic research in emerging diseases has fit very nicely into the new Department of Global Health. And Andy Sturgachis has been a, done a wonderful job as the acting chair during this transition. Uh, Fred Connell was chair for a while while Andy was on uh, sabbatical, and now Andy is back to close out the department. There have been other changes in the school since I've been dean. Dave Eaton, who was the associate dean of research here, moved up to associate vice provost for research. 
and we now have Emily White as the Associate Dean for Research, and in fact, she's really doing more this year because she's doubling for Fred Connell, who happens to be in Nepal this year, starting a new School of Public Health there. Tom Fleming resigned as Chair of Biostatistics a couple of years ago. We were very happy to be able to recruit Bruce Weir from North Carolina State. Uh, he brought special expertise to the department in genetics and genomics. And unfortunately, I've learned this year that Bill Dowling is planning to step down as Chair of Health Services, and so we are recruiting a new chair for that department. Uh, one of the things the school has always done was to seek outstanding leaders in their field to be chairs of departments because our chairs really serve as role models for all of the faculties in their departments. Uh, one of the big challenges I think for me personally has to balance, been to balance my time. Uh, time between national activities, uh, university activities, school activities, how do I balance that, that I really truly serve the school best? Not my needs, but really what, what best serves the school. Um, I decided early on I had great leadership uh, support, administrative support, certainly within the school and within the dean's office, so my focus really should be more external to the school. Uh, about the first thing I did, as I described, Mark and I did these visits around the state. Uh, so we reached out to the local community and the state uh, public health community. And then I went on to accept some roles in national committees. I was fortunate to be invited to participate in two IOM committees, Institute of Medicine committees. The first was the future of the public's health, and the second one was about educating public health professionals for the 21st uh, century. These were terrific opportunities to meet public health leaders uh, across the nation and also to advance some of our school initiatives. I also served two terms as a council member for the Council on Education in Public Health. It's our school's accrediting body, and it was a really good chance for me to visit review other schools and learn a thing or two from some of their best practices. Within the university, I have also served as chair-elect uh, and also the chair of the Board of Deans and um, as also chaired a number of dean search committees and review committees. And uh, it's been a pleasure to do that because we've really had university leadership uh, well, very well done under President Emmert and Provost Wise. Another thing that I am doing right now is I am the chair of the Association of Schools of Public Health. That's the association of the 40 accredited schools of public health. Um, and my reason for doing that was I hope that national involvement would lead to recognition of how great our school really is. I think Gil did it terrific job of bringing recognition to the school, to the many national and international activities in which he participated. So I think the school continues to thrive despite its extreme lack of resources such as space and state funding. I think most of this is due to the entrepreneurial spirit, um, good interdisciplinary collaboration, a lot of collegiality among faculty and staff. It's a very mutually supportive culture. Everyone has a good, I think, can-do spirit. I, I'm amazed at how many of the obstacles people really cope with day-to-day. Uh, -day. And I think it's overridden by a strong commitment to the students and also a common belief that public health is a very good thing and it's really worth working hard to achieve. I think although we are one of the poorest resourced of the 40 accredited schools of public health in the nation, uh, we're consistently ranked uh, fourth in the U.S. Uh, News and World Reports. Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, and the University of North Carolina are ahead of us, and they have a lot more resources than, than we do. So I think we do well to be up there in that group. This year our, came out, there were three of our programs were ranked in the faculty scholarly productivity ranking, which is a survey of higher education institutions and faculty publications. And we did very well in that. Uh, this year, as in a couple of years past, uh, our grant and contract awards have been over $80 million. This puts us in the top four of the schools and colleges at the university, along with School of Medicine, Arts and Sciences, and Engineering. We have over 30 uh, 
research centers and institutes, and 85% of our funding comes from research. So we do very well at that, even in some very difficult uh, federal funding times right now. Uh, one of the ways we wanted to recognize the excellence in our faculty was to start in 2000 a distinguished faculty lecture series. So quarterly, uh, we get to hear the research from one of our faculty stars. The departments uh, rotate uh, doing this each quarter. And along with that, we've, uh, we have a quarterly publication called Spotlights of Research that uh, talks about the great research our faculty do. We changed Gill's annual uh, date of the school address to be more of a school awards ceremony. And then in 2001, at the request of our students, we started having a school graduation ceremony in June. And we have now added the school awards ceremony to that. So we do that both at the same time. And in 2002, we started the annual Founders Luncheon, and this was to recognize the founding fathers and mothers who contributed to our school's success at the very beginning. I feel myself very fortunate to have had the opportunity to spend most of my professional career here in the School of Public Health. It started with a graduate school. And I must say at that time, I never envisioned uh, my future here in this way at that time. And I'm, I'm sure that everybody else who knew me then probably didn't envision it that way either. Um, none of my steps have really been particularly planned or particularly sought after. It's just been wonderful people all along the way who have opened, opened the doors for me. I'm very honored to be the fourth dean of what I feel is the absolutely the best school on the UW campus, uh, following in the footsteps of such great deans as Tom, Bob, and Gail, who really paved the way, and also the many faculty and staff who have, and I'm sure will continue to contribute to this school's excellence. So, so this history project uh, was started last year with the assistance of Eric Swenson and Sid Fox, and it really resulted from our desire to capture how it all happened. The end.